I'm a huge believer in opportunity. I don't care where you come from, what your background is. If you have aptitude, you should be afforded the opportunity to come forward. One of the frameworks I really like is subsidy philanthropy versus solutions philanthropy. In society, as Thomas said, where so many things are broken and where real leadership is needed, subsidy philanthropy is not enough. Welcome to the Money Maze podcast. I'm Simon Brewer, and Will Campion and I have created this show to explore and unravel some of the mysteries surrounding the investment business. You can keep up to date by visiting moneymazepodcast.com, and please sign up to our newsletter to ensure you won't miss a release. If you enjoy this show, please subscribe, and we'd love you to tell a friend or colleague about it. Thank you for listening. This month, Money Maze podcast host Simon Brewer has handed over the reins to me. I'm Jen Prosek, founder and managing partner of Prosek Partners. After being featured on the show earlier this month, I'm delighted to be the guest host of this series recorded from our Madison Avenue office in New York. I'm honored to be here today with Thomas Tell and Joe Lonsdale, who are literally reshaping the world with their investments in emerging technologies. Joe Lonsdale founded three companies that have reached multi-billion dollar valuations all before the age of 40 and is now running a multi-billion dollar VC focused on the tech space. He is also the founder of a college in Austin, which we'll touch on a little bit later in this podcast. Thomas Tull is also a self-made billionaire, investor, and entrepreneur. He founded Tullco, where he uses AI and emerging technologies to transform businesses. He sits on the Dean's Advisory Board of MIT and the Board of Carnegie Mellon. Thomas is also a conservationist, a philanthropist, and a musician. I had the honor of watching Thomas open for the Rolling Stones. His band is that good. And he's the co-owner of two sports teams, the NFL's Pittsburgh Steelers, and also the baseball team, the New York Yankees. As you can tell, this is going to be a great conversation. Let's get into it. Joe and Thomas, you're both stunningly successful repeat entrepreneurs. I want to start at the beginning. Where did you grow up? What influenced you in those early years? And how did you fall in love with technology and investing? I'm going to start with you, Thomas. Tell us a little bit about life in the early years. Well, I grew up in upstate New York with a single mom. I worked a couple jobs to keep the lights on. Sports was a big part of my life, and so was trying to help out to make sure that we didn't come off the rails. And if anything, I'm sure that had an impact in shaping the way I see problems or urgency or any of those things. And I knew, I think at a pretty young age, that I was unemployable. It would be very hard for me to work for somebody else in kind of a traditional way. And so I think all of those things pushed me in the direction that my life has gone in. That's so interesting. I love that you say you were unemployable. Joe, were you unemployable? Tell us about your early years. And did you also discover you were somewhat unemployable? That's funny. I definitely have strong opinions that I would always tell people. My father, I would say, Dad, you're the smartest guy. Why aren't you in charge? And he'd always lose political battles because he'd tell people they were stupid. So I probably have some of that in me (laughs) as well. Probably makes it better to build things. I grew up in Silicon Valley. And I was really lucky to have a bunch of friends around me who were math champions and chess champions. And they taught me to program when I was a young kid. So I was lucky to be in this upper middle class tech area where I was able to build a lot of stuff with my friends and learn a lot about it. And went to Stanford Computer Science, got to be at PayPal. My friends who were at PayPal, they were all older than me. And when they left, they started about 16 different billion dollar companies, YouTube, Tesla and SpaceX and LinkedIn and et cetera. So I was just really lucky to be born into this. And be very competitive and have lots of strong opinions, which I think is a good way to start to be an entrepreneur. Definitely. Tell me, did you both know that you would be entrepreneurs or that you would be very successful? Did you have a vision and were you confident in the beginning or was it a surprise where you landed? Joe, it sounds like you had early confidence and vision and people around you that inspired you that you could do it too. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about that. I guess I was probably always an obnoxious, overconfident little kid we were way ahead in champions and all these math and chess things and maybe too confident, which is a little dangerous. In high school, a lot of my friends who were a little older built all these companies in the bubble and I saw all these things got built and I was trying to help and all they all blew up. So that was probably a good experience to temper yourself that there's reality as well. And maybe at 14 or 15, I thought I'd be a revolutionary or something, but it turns out an entrepreneur is a good way to channel that energy. And Thomas, how about you? I mean, you grew up 
literally with nothing. Where did your confidence come from? Did you have a vision? Did you know, or did it come as a surprise? <laughs> no. When people say to me, could you have imagined this? No, I lacked the tools or even the, you know, I didn't know that part of this world even existed. For me, I think it was more of a grind of just one foot in front of the other. Here's what needs to get done. There's no cavalry coming. You either figure it out or you're not eating or the lights go off. Definitely didn't have a vision other than probably knew at a young age, I did well in school. I had imagination, things like that. But no, I think it was always going to be more of a grind your way through it. Just show up and do what needs to be done. And I've been very fortunate, obviously. Not that anyone is listening to this podcast for my story, but I was a little bit more in the Thomas camp. Survival <laughs> was a motivator, but very interesting. So you're both investors in technology and probably know more than most people about how technology is shaping the world. Tell us about emerging technologies, AI, what you're excited about, what you're scared of, and talk to us about a tech investment you've made that really excites you. Joe, why don't you start? Well, what I'm scared of, I'm convinced at this point that AI should lead to another industrial revolution. So this is very exciting and very scary. The last industrial revolution we still debate about in our society. It was 1870 to 1900. And on one hand, gross national product went up 230%. Basically, poor people are twice as well off after these 30 years. It's, it's extraordinarily positive. Life completely changes in so many ways for everyone. On the other hand, we still talk about the robber barons and we still talk about other views that some of the left has about that. So I think this disruption is very controversial. And overall, I think the disruption coming from AI, it's going to change society a lot. If we do it right, our poor people, again, will be twice or three times as well off. It's going to be very good for society. You're going to be able to personalize education, personalize health. It's amazing. But on the other hand, there's lots of risks. And I guess the one I'm most scared about, you probably have heard a lot about recently, is right now we're on GPT-4, GPT-5 is coming out. It's very likely that GPT-11 could come out in a decade. And if you have your own giant super cluster of GPUs, which can run these things, the giant computer brain, it's very possible you have something that's way more advanced than people if you could use that to do bad things. And it's not clear to me we want every autocrat around the world to be able to have a giant super intelligence. And that's very scary. And how do we regulate that in a way that I don't want to regulate away the industrial revolution. I don't want to regulate away all this stuff that gives government power to censor. But I also don't want to give any crazy multi-billionaire the ability to destroy the world. So I think there's some very interesting things coming up that are tough there. So what excites you? What's something that excites you, an investment you're making? What excites me is all these new possibilities in all these areas. Defense is an area where Thomas is doing amazing work, and I built some companies as well. I think EPRIS is a great example of what you could do with AI, new technology, and defense. And what's exciting about defense is that the history of the last thousand years is really shaped by what's possible in the defensive world. A very simple example is that if defensive warfare is stronger, you have lots of small city-states, if offensive warfare is stronger, you get guys like Charlemagne knocking down cities' walls with cannons all of a sudden once they exist and you build giant empires. And so the whole shape of governments in general and what's possible, one of my favorite books is Philip Bobbitt's Shield of Achilles, which maps out the five different types of constitutional governments that emerge based on military possibilities the last thousand years. And, and right now with Epirus, you're able to take AI to control power in new ways on very small time scales. So you could shoot down electronics miles away. It's going to be tens of miles away very soon. This is a huge shift in warfare towards the defensive side that fundamentally changes what's possible, what's not possible. I think it's very good for peace in the world. I think it's very good for small city states. So it's just really exciting seeing how the whole world could change in the next 10 or 20 years based on these new possibilities and based on making defense stronger. Thomas, you're super involved in organizations and educational institutions like MIT. You use emerging tech and AI in pretty much every investment you make. What excites you? What scares you? Give us a sense. I'll start with what scares me a little bit. Because I'm more into physics than I am the biology side of the building, what's happening in biology right now, biologics, synthetic biology, has the opportunity to do many amazing things. I'm just excited about what can happen in terms of diseases and enhancing human life and curing things that make a whole bunch of people miserable. On the other hand, we have some adversaries and pockets of the world who are, are using biology to weaponize it. And I think when we look at what happened with COVID, which relatively speaking 
is not nearly as dangerous as something that could be weaponized, that definitely worries me. And when we look at the world's response to COVID, could have been, I think, much more cohesive and better response, better prepared, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing that worries me. On the other hand, a couple of things that I'm excited about, I think Joe absolutely accurately laid out the potential problems with artificial intelligence. I think the upside is it's going to permeate every area of our economy. I think it has an opportunity to greatly enhance life. There's going to be discoveries that come from this that our imaginations can't even get our head around. There's going to be second, third, fourth order effects and impact. I think it's going to have probably as big an impact as anything that's happened in my lifetime so far. So all of these things have a exciting and then a yeah, but. And I think that's where leadership comes in. That's where attacking these problems and thinking about them in an informed way is important. So that's one of the things that I talk a lot about to folks in Congress is digital fluency in our leadership. It's important if you're going to solve and approach these issues in an informed way to have that digital fluency and literacy. Well, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. We've got lots more to come, but a quick pause. Bramont is also a sponsor of the Money Maze podcast. Bramont is a British company based in Henley that was established 20 years ago by two young brothers whose dream was to design and engineer beautiful chronometers. When Giles English, one of those brothers, appeared as a guest on the Money Maze podcast last year, he brought to life the wonderful history of British watchmaking, helping to explain why the world sets its time by Greenwich Mean Time. And he captured the incredible challenge of mastering the complexities involved in making exquisitely engineered timepieces. He has said, never judge one of our watches until you've held it in your hand and felt the quality. And both Will Campion and I have bought a watch, and we love them. Great innovation, a tangible love for their mission, resulting in beautiful, world-class luxury wristwatches. In addition, I'd like to quickly share a few details about GAIN, who we're highlighting and supporting as our 2023 third quarter partner. GAIN, which stands for Girls Are Investors, is a leading charity dedicated to improving gender diversity in the investment management industry. GAIN currently has a team of over a thousand volunteers dedicated to helping young women understand the industry and their potential careers in it. They're always open to welcoming new volunteers or sponsors who are looking to support their mission. If this is something yourself or any of your colleagues might be interested in, please visit gainuk.org to learn more or just tap the link in the episode description right here in your preferred podcast app. So you both mentioned the military space and the impact on technology and emerging technologies on keeping countries and people safe. Talk to us about your both investors in the private sector innovating alongside the government and militaries. I mean, Joe, you pioneered this really with Palantir when you co-founded it. Talk to us about how the private sector and the public sector can and should and will come together to really make an impact. Well, they need to. This is very important. It's basically, I see it as a duty of the leaders of the technology and business world in the U.S. that if we want to keep our freedom, we want to keep America's place in the world and the geopolitical stability, we have to step up. It's interesting. A lot's changed in the last 70 years. It used to be that to innovate, it was very, very expensive. And so only large institutions were on the cutting edge. So it was either the government, maybe Bell Labs, maybe HP at scale, but it was just so tough in the mid 20th century. And so in part tied to that, in part tied to the total war and the culture that was going on, you got a lot of the best and brightest working in the government, working very closely with the government. And what you've seen now, 70, 80 years later, is because innovation is much cheaper, it's become much more distributed because the upside to the best innovators is so high. There's so much intellectual leverage. It's very, very hard for the government, not only to hire these people, but to even understand who the best people are anymore. It doesn't have that critical mass that like it did 80 years ago. So if we want our government to stay on the cutting edge, the only solution is the top innovators, the people who've built the top companies, the people who are tied to the top talent in business, step up and do this. And this is something that after 9-11, we decided this was a really important mission with Palantir, both to protect civil liberties and to make the government actually competent enough to use its data to stop attacks and prevent attacks. I'm really proud we ended up stopping huge numbers of attacks there, helping capture a lot of the bad guys. And 
Now, similarly, a decade later, it's not just that the IT is broken, it's that the defense industrial complex in a lot of areas has not been innovating as much and has not been able to be held to account to force it to innovate, again, because of the lack of talent in the government to even understand how to do that. And so it's actually critical we step up with some of the most talented people and do this. And you're seeing this now with Androl, with Aparis, with a bunch of these other companies that we're working on. Thomas, you are supportive of this thesis as well and an investor in the space. Give us your perspective. Well, I believe very deeply in America. And for all of our flaws, I still think we're the greatest country on earth and it's worth fighting for. And it's messy and it's hard. And that means that citizens have a responsibility to be informed and to step up where need be. And I wish we lived in a world where our adversaries teamed up with us to try to cure cancer and do all kinds of exciting things. But that's not the world that we woke up to today. And so I think in order to keep the peace, you have to come from a place of strength. I never served in uniform. I have absolute reverence for men and women that keep our country safe every day, putting themselves, sacrificing family time. I think if you haven't done it or been adjacent to it, it's almost hard to imagine. And I think that the private sector has a responsibility and a duty to try to help those that are standing on the wall for us. So investing in spaces that help us from a defensive standpoint and just saying, hey, where can we be helpful? How can we help you go faster, provide some risk capital, some expertise? But I think some of the greatest achievements in our country, you've seen the government come together with academia, come together with the private sector. And I think we're in one of those eras right now. You mentioned everyone around the world, and this podcast is based in London, but obviously everyone in London and Europe is watching also the Americans versus the Chinese and what's happening with that relationship. Let's talk a little bit about U.S. and China. I think you mentioned rightfully so. I'm guessing that China is graduating engineers who do want to go into military technology. Talk to us about where their talent's going versus where our talent's going and whether that's an issue. In China, Jen, you don't have a choice, really. All right. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. (laughs) It's very different. Now, listen, America has its flaws, as Thomas said, but China is an authoritarian dictatorship at this point. And they have a lot of internal problems. They have a huge demographic problem and and they have a lot of credit problems. One of the best ways she's going to try to keep power and the Communist Party is going to try to keep power is to have external enemies. They need enemies the next 10 or 15 years. They're going to have a martial drumbeat regardless. Taiwan or not, they're going to find excuses for martial drumbeats right now because they need an external enemy not to be attacked themselves by their people. They know Chinese history very well is that when these crises come, very often the times the leaders are killed and thrown out. So they're terrified. And they're so terrified, in fact, that Xi Jinping moved extremely hard against the tech sector the last few years. The tech sector had become a place, by the way, that the smartest, brightest young people wanted to go into. That wasn't the case 10, 20 years ago in China. 20 years ago in China, the brightest people wanted to go into government. That's how you got power. That's how you got wealth. That's how you were respected. That was no longer the case five years ago. It was the brightest ones were going into tech. Thomas said he wishes our adversaries were curing cancer with us. I think actually a lot of people five, 10 years ago in China were doing a lot of really relevant innovation. And there were some really great tech companies being built. She moved against it. Every single successful person in China right now is terrified to be building new tech companies. I think Thomas and I have had a lot of success. We were lucky to be in that position. And we're using it now to build new companies, to back new companies, to create new things. The tech leaders in China, the business leaders in China in those positions, that makes them a target. Tens of them disappeared. This is not a conspiracy theory. He definitely moved against the tech sector and eliminated a lot of those people to come out of their power positions. So I think he's usually weakened in their tech sector, which helps us a lot. But he's also going to keep pushing this martial stuff. He's going to keep putting good engineers into scary areas. So we have a huge adversary to deal with here. So on the cover of The Economist this week is this. You can't see that, but it's called Peak China, question mark. And the whole article, it says China's economy will neither collapse nor overtake America's by much. That could make the world safer. So the economist's point of view is that China may be peaking and that the US and China are gonna be locked in this dead match where one's not really bigger than the other, but fighting for it for a very long time. What do the two of you think? You're very close to this. What do you think about the US and China? Last time we spoke, Joe, you were very, very positive on the United States because of what you just said. You think the economist is right? I think that China has a lot more engineers than us working in these areas. 
I think they have some very, very competent people who know how to innovate now. It used to be we say, oh, China doesn't innovate, it just copies. And actually, there's a lot of innovators there. A lot of them went to school, by the way, in the US and went back to China. They're a very serious threat. Economically, I think The Economist is probably right. I think they have a lot of challenges in China. I think their tech sector has been hit hard. It doesn't mean that they're not a massive global threat, that they're not a huge adversary, and that this could easily go either way. So I think we have to take it very seriously to deter them from wanting to engage us. Thomas, do you agree with that, or are you of your own spin? They're the most serious challenge that we've faced as a nation in a very long time. They're patient, they've got a growing economy, and they don't debate things. So the advantage to that is they can move very quickly because one person's in charge. And I think one of the keys to counterbalancing all of this is our partner nations. And the things that the United States has done with its very long partnerships with the Five Eyes, with Britain, with Canada, with Australia, the things that we're doing with South Korea, building deeper relationships with India, you can't go it alone. And I think there are some amazing technologies coming out of these areas, Japan. And I think that with the situation in the Ukraine, the bonds of the West have proven to be stronger than people predicted. And I think that all of those things are important. And the countries that see the world the same way have to continue to work together. We're looking at investing in things internationally. I think that's part of what gives us strength is innovation, partnership, and true allies and friendships. That's very well said, Thomas. I think all these countries, Japan and India included, hopefully Vietnam, it all be critical to deterring China. We have to get that right. So we've all seen the impact COVID's had on our supply chains, and many countries are deglobalizing and certainly looking at local manufacturing. Again, Thomas, you are a major investor in this theme. You are bringing manufacturing back inside the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? And we know you had a big announcement about a week ago for your Rebuild Manufacturing Venture. Tell us about all of that. Well, Jeff Wilkie, who's a brilliant guy and a good friend, was an important executive in Amazon, came to me four or five years ago and talked to me about how the United States was losing its ability to do complex manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing and how important that was going to be going forward. So we started Rebuild, which is a holding company structure. And I believe we own 13 companies now, a lot of aerospace, a lot of important things that are done here in the U.S. And I think instead of the inward facing, we're going to be jingoistic and things like that, it really is about how can we make sure that we're able to do critical things If it's not pandemic or war or climate, you just have to make sure that critical things remain in your skill sets to be able to do. And I think you're seeing a resurgence now in focus on this. So it's something that I think is very, very important. We have to be resilient. And I think we have to have the ability to make critical things ourselves and to not be in a position where we're sitting there whether it's a natural disaster or a conflict, not able to take care of ourselves because we lack the skill sets. Rebuild just had, I think, an $81 million investment in Pennsylvania. Could you tell us a little bit about that? The old Alcoa plant in Pittsburgh is going to be brought back to life. Very, very exciting thing. Pittsburgh's one of those great Midwest success stories of an area that's pivoted away from steel and industry into high tech. We have great universities here, Carnegie Mellon, certainly a world-class place. It was really great to see that come together. And I think it'll be pretty impactful for the state of Pennsylvania. Joe, you also believe in bringing back manufacturing to the United States. You're also a big infrastructure investor. Walk us through your ideas here. Obviously, it was much cheaper to do certain things outside the U.S., and that was globally more economically efficient for a long time. People debate whether or not that was morally right or not. I know a lot of populist voters were against it. I think it was the right thing to do in some ways. Obviously, it was probably a mistake to give China a stranglehold over so many of our industries. But overall, the thing that's changed in the last 10 years is you now have innovation AI that makes advanced manufacturing much, much cheaper. It's much more practical 
to do a lot of things here you couldn't have done economically. At the end of the day, you have to be economic. You can't just bring it back here for the sake of populism, obviously, which is not something Thomas Rye would do. But I think we now have the ability to use 3D metal cutting in ways and machine shops makes them way more efficient. One of my favorites we're doing is we have advanced biomanufacturing going on here with National Resilience Bio. Change the name to Resilience Bio because people don't like the word national sometimes if they're in academia, which is still a very sensitive topic. But effectively, we think that the ability to make the most advanced therapeutics in the world, whether it's cell therapy, gene therapy, mRNA, should exist here and with our allies, not just in China and out there. And that's something we started right in the middle of COVID, got lucky in the sense that mRNA vaccine ended up being created and using a lot of our plants. And we've now raised billions of dollars and are scaling this up. It's doing really well. So there's things like that you could be doing in the US now that are profitable that weren't before. All eyes are going to be on the U.S. with the election. I'm not going to get into or make you get into your political choices, although you're welcome to speak about them. I do think the world looks at the U.S. election for good reason. I was told by one of my best friends in Beirut, it's not your election, it's the world's election. Everybody cares about who's elected in the United States. If you were the president, what would you be prioritizing? You're free to talk about your political interests or not, but I'm just really interested. It sounds like I know, based on this podcast, how you would prioritize the focus, but tell us a little bit about how you would prioritize what needs to get done. I could take that first, Thomas. These are always dangerous things to talk about. I think the job, number one, of government is to focus on helping America be dynamic and prosperous and helping the least well off more effectively. For me, what that means is growth is really important, and it means workers are really important. On the growth side, our regulatory apparatus has just grown to gargantuan levels. It probably destroys about one and a half, two percent of growth per year in this country, which means that our economy is half as small as it would have been if we'd fixed this 30 years ago. We desperately need to fix that for the next 30 years. So you need to protect people while not having crazy bureaucracy. You can probably cut half the bureaucracy in DC, but do it more efficiently. And that's similar for defense spending as well. There's millions of these people in the procurement offices in the DOD now, and it's a total mess. You probably want to cut most of the civilian population out of the DOD, make it slim, make it more dynamic, totally reform procurement to be more pro-innovation. The money should be less focused on being a jobs program, more focused on being what actually makes America pro-defense. If we want to use money for welfare, let's use it honestly for welfare. Let's not have a pretend welfare that the right supports in the DOD that creates jobs that aren't needed. So there's just so many things like this where you can make all of our government more efficient, more effective, and, and work a lot better. So those are some of the types of things I would focus on. How about you, Thomas? What would you focus on? Look, I think there are times in world history that leaders can coast because nation states are big and pretty resilient. And there's other times that people need to stand up and need to exhibit true leadership. And that doesn't mean reacting to polls. That doesn't mean trying to score political points and thinking about being elected. It means doing what you know is right. And sometimes those are hard choices. They're hard messages. And I think in the West, the United States, but in the West in particular, selling fear, playing on people's worst instincts, that's not leadership. And I think we need sophisticated adults to step up and to lead and to bring people back together because the differences sometimes that we have, and unfortunately, I think social media can amplify these things, make them worse. We have adversaries that are in chat rooms and all over the place, getting people to get in worse fights than they normally would. You need to recognize that. So I think stepping up, telling people the truth, even if it's hard, and making hard choices and being leaders instead of people that are trying to get elected is important. The second thing that I would say is we need to recognize that technology is going to change the workforce. It's going to change the way people make a living, and those things need to be prepared for. Because I think when you really boil it down, people want to feel safe. People want to feel not only physically secure, and that means that I can count on taking a walk in my neighborhood without being accosted or mugged, or I can send my children to school without worrying about a mass shooting. So we have that kind of safety. And then we have, I should be able to have a mortgage and have a home and provide for my family. So there's all these different things that are getting pulled in different directions. So I think that almost taking a first principle approach and saying, what are the problems? What are the complexities? And how are we gonna speak in a loud, clear voice, 
even if some of the choices that we face are scary, they're not going away. So I keep coming back to folks that will stand up and lead. And I think that's something that I'm hoping for and looking forward to. Well, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. We've got lots more to come, but a quick pause. We're delighted to have Schroeder's as a sponsor and corporate partner. Schroeder's is a global investment manager whose purpose is to provide excellent investment performance through active decision-making. For more than two centuries, Schroeder's has evolved their understanding of markets, offering investment solutions across fixed income, equities, multi-asset, as well as private markets through Schroeder's Capital. Schroeder's actively invests in companies with responsible and durable business models. They're also a leading specialist in impact investing for clients who want to maximize positive change. Capital is at risk with investing. Last year, I interviewed Gary Boom, chief executive of Bordeaux Index. Wine is a great love of mine, and as he explained, Bordeaux Index has become a major disruptor in the way that wine is bought and sold, and has sought to redefine the way a wine merchant works. I've been really impressed with their business and have been buying wine from them since that interview. So we're delighted that the Money Maze podcast is now also sponsored by LiveTrade, their world-leading fine wine trading platform. LiveTrade has changed the way fine wine is bought and sold worldwide. You can instantly buy and sell or place bids and offers on key wines from Bordeaux, Champagne, Italy and other world regions. Their two-way pricing offers guaranteed trading liquidity with no fees. So I recommend you have a look at their website, Bordeaux Index forward slash live trade. So you've both been successful pretty much in every way. You're both self-made, but one of the privileges that comes with great wealth is philanthropy. And you're both great philanthropists. You have interests. Thomas, tell us a little bit about where you're focused in terms of your philanthropy. So a couple different areas. I think exploring breakthroughs in healthcare and medical science is a big area of focus. As I mentioned earlier on the podcast, there are some amazing things coming down that brilliant people are putting together around CRISPR and other things, and especially around children's health. That's important. I think conservation from the standpoint of everything has to be thoughtful and reasonable, but if we don't take care of our ecosystem, our planet, and our natural resources here in America. We have amazing parks, things of that nature. We have to take care of these things. We don't want them to disappear. And then I also think about, I'm a huge believer in opportunity. I don't care where you come from, what your background is. If you have aptitude, you should be afforded the opportunity to come forward. And that's something else that I believe in very, very deeply. So those are, I would say, the big themes around things that are important to me. And education is right at the top of that list, certainly. Good pivot to Joe. Joe, what's important to you? I know that you founded a college. Tell us about that. I wrote a piece recently on philanthropy, and we do all sorts of different things. But one of the frameworks I really like is subsidy philanthropy versus solutions philanthropy. And a subsidy philanthropy is when you have an existing system that people just give money to, put their name on buildings, just support what already is out there. And and in society, as Thomas said, where so many things are broken and where real leadership is needed, subsidy philanthropy is not enough. If you just put in your name on a dysfunctional university or where the tuitions are skyrocketing when students are coming out without the right skills, subsidizing that a little bit with scholarships or whatever, frankly, it's cowardly because everyone's just going to applaud you lightly and you're going to get your name and you're going to be a good citizen, but you're not going to fix the problem. So solution philanthropy, which is the other side of it, is actually trying to solve the problem. And by the way, philanthropy from Greek is supposed to mean a love of mankind. Subsidy philanthropy is what people do when they want to be loved by mankind and they avoid controversy. Solutions philanthropy is engaging in controversy. It's saying, I'm actually going to go fix it. And so there's two main areas I work on. One of them is we try to do model legislation and confront broken systems all around our country in tons of states. I'm really proud of that at Cicero Institute. The other one is UATX, a new university. And I'm working on this with Neil Ferguson, with Barry Weiss, with a lot of top academics who've come over from a lot of top schools. And we believe we could build one of the top universities in our country with a totally different framework, which supports free speech, which supports free thinking, which is going to graduate people who themselves are going to be the type of people that focus on solutions versus focusing on virtue signaling. That is terrific. A lot of people on this podcast would love to know, and I would too, what do you think is the quality about you that allows you to have serial success? If you had to single it down to one quality that you have or one belief you have, 
that has enabled your success. What would that be, Thomas? Honestly, if you don't think that luck has something to do with it, then I think you're missing something. But I also think that there's an aspect of just getting up every day, grit, hustle, all the things that don't come. It's not just, hey, I'd like to lose some weight. What's the easy way to do it? We'll just take this pill. No, no, it's actually hard. It's consistency. It's doing things over and over and over again that produce results. So for me personally, it's just showing up, working hard on things, staring at problems and taking them as they are, not as you wish they were. And then I think the other thing, when I talked a little bit ago about leadership, I think in corporate leadership, it's clear communication and letting people believe in something. We've become pretty pessimistic sometimes. And I think people actually want to be part of something and believe in something. And if you can provide platforms with clarity to do that, that has worked well for me. Excellent. How about you, Joe? What is it about you? I guess not being willing to accept that things are broken or not being willing to just go along with the status quo and being able to see what's possible. We call it conceptual gaps in the world. And so most of the companies I built, most of the things I've done, they've been very mission-driven companies. They've really inspired a lot of people because they said, here's where the world is now and here's where it can be we get this right. So we've been able to attract some of the best and brightest and to get them to work very, very hard, very persistently, not giving up. I think having a little bit of a sense of the inevitability of being able to do things, maybe it's overconfidence, maybe it's something else, but being able to envision what's possible and then just keep working at it in a realist way and not give up. That combination, you can get a lot of things done. The reality is relentlessness is definitely part of every entrepreneur's toolkit. You mentioned the role that luck plays, Thomas, and I'm going to share something that's been a framework that's been very powerful in my life. Jim Collins talked about a concept called return on luck. He says the most successful people either know when they're in a luck moment and they know to stop and max it out. They're also good at turning a bad luck moment into a good luck moment. I always feel like my whole career was based on a bad luck moment turning into a good luck moment. I'd love both of you to tell me about What's a good luck moment that happened to you that you knew to max out or a bad luck moment that you were able to turn around? I do believe in luck in some sense, but I think you can also, for me, the things I've messed up in my career have also been my fault, not just bad luck. In 2008, I was trying to do too many things at once. I was a top trader of the hedge fund. We were scaling Palantir. We had all sorts of things we were building on both sides and it overextended myself. I'd had some people in different places that weren't the right people. And by overextending myself, I had a couple of things blow up. Things were basically reacted very badly and everything felt like it was in danger of blowing up. It was really healthy because I'd had so much success the previous five years that even though it was bad luck, in some ways it was very, very lucky because it taught me a bunch of lessons and really helped me focus, helped me reorient myself to know what to do and what not to do in the future and to know how to make sure to focus and to get things right and to not overextend myself. So I think sometimes your big failures are maybe some bad luck, but it's also really lucky if you treat them correctly. Completely. How about you, Thomas? I agree with what Joe said too. If you're in the right place at the right time, you still need to take the right steps to take advantage of that. If you can see what the angle or opportunity is, that can be a very powerful thing. And on the other hand, I'm with Joe on this. I mean, there's times you look at all the people at COVID that ran family restaurants or whatever else, it doesn't mean they weren't running them well. There's a global pandemic. That's an example to me of hard times brought on by bad circumstances. But most of the things, I agree with Joe, that when I do the postmortem on things I've screwed up, there's a pretty clear through line of bad decision. And especially for me, in the times that I did the work and there's everything from the analysis to the gut feel of just feels wrong but I would like this to be true. I really would like this deal to happen, or I'd like to hire this person and have them work out at this company I've invested in. Almost every time I've done that, it has not worked. It has blown up. And when you do the postmortem, you look back and say, well, it was all there in front of you and you did it anyway. So those are the moments that have not worked out well for me. So you don't build enterprise and scale enterprises as successful or as large as you both have without 
being great leaders. And most great leaders have belief systems. I always say at Prosec, one of my, I have so many mantras, but maybe one of my best ones is solve, don't dwell. Spend all your energy solving. Don't dwell on the issues. Do you have a couple of isms yourself or leadership beliefs that you could share with the audience that have helped you lead organizations? A couple of frameworks I use for things I help with. One powerful framework I've written on that was a big deal for me is the idea of dialectics, where the truth exists on opposite extremes, which I think is very unintuitive to most people, that you could have a deep truth on one side, and then you have a deep truth on the totally other side, and then to be a great leader or even a great thinker, you have to be able to keep those in mind at once. I'll give you an example, is the very best product organizations have both sides. So Steve Jobs used to say, along with the guy who ran Sony in the 80s, they used to say, I don't care what the customer wants. I'm going to tell them what they want. I'm going to see what's possible. I'm going to tell them what they want. Now, on the other hand, as we all know, if you're running a large company with huge numbers of customers and you're building a product organization, you need somebody taking the 100 points of feedback, mapping it all out, slicing and dicing the cohorts and deciding what to build based on that as well. Because there is an iterative data-driven process that takes 14 hours a day with someone who's amazing. It's interesting because you need both of those to exist for this to work. And those are both very opposed to each other. So, So to be able to have a great leader who could do that it's really tough. Another one along those lines is just, for me, a lot of creating companies, my framework is that building a billion dollar company is winning a gold medal in the Olympics, by which I mean, it's not a very balanced or healthy thing to do. If you meet someone who to the gold medal Olympics, they were obsessed. They were obsessed with it. They were doing everything they possibly could with it. And there's all frameworks that you kind of can pull out of that where I'm not saying this is normatively a good thing to do. Maybe most people shouldn't be doing this, but you have to make exceptions for being imbalanced in certain ways and putting up with certain things and just driving forward in a crazy way. And I think you need to realize things like that in order to achieve at the very, very highest levels. And that's something you have to actually talk openly to your executive team and others about. Are we in here for this or are we in here to do something else? And the cultures have to be shaped by that realization that it's not necessarily a healthy long-term thing, but we have to do this to get it right. I love the Olympic athlete analogy. That's brilliant. Thomas, how about you? Any leadership mantras you share with your teams that are important to you? I don't have a lot of quippy sayings. Somebody more clever than me, I heard honor doesn't know circumstance, which I like. And then I'm a huge believer that you're being paid and compensated for your aptitude, your opinions, your work. So you need to express those things. Don't have meetings and then go have other meetings where you shut the door and complain about what just happened. That's counterproductive. So I think, and especially in this day and age, you really need to communicate with people about what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're going to weigh and measure. What metrics are we going to measure success by and what does it look like so we can recognize it when it shows up or doesn't show up? I love that. Great companies are really metric focused. I agree. That's terrific. So we're going to run out of time here. So I'm going to ask you my last question. I call it check this out, meaning tell the audience something you're obsessed with right now, a TV show, a book, an app, whatever it is. What should they check out that you're obsessed with right now, Joe? I'll tell you what delighted me today. My friend Barry Weiss has something called the Free Press, which is probably the fastest growing media company in the world. She used to work for the New York Times and left very publicly. And her wife actually writes their Friday column, Nellie, who is also a prominent columnist. And I thought, she's just on fire. Her last several columns have been amazing. And it was hilarious today, too. So if you don't read Nellie's Friday column at the Free Press, you should definitely subscribe. I think you should check out. That's great. Nellie will love that. How about you, Thomas? What should the audience check out? Just a fun thing. For no particular reason, I just was passed a book and read called Why Dinosaurs Matter. And I just... The author, who's a paleontologist, a leading paleontologist, just wrote a remarkable book that was a page turner, super interesting from a science perspective. And I just thought it was charming and really enjoyed it. That's terrific. Well, I could talk to you both for hours, as you know, and I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Many thanks for listening to this episode of the show. If you enjoyed the conversation, please do share the interview on your social media or write a quick review of the show on your preferred podcast app. You can find out more about the podcast and sign up for the excellent newsletter via moneymazepodcast.com. Plus, find out more about my business, Prosec, at prosec.com. I founded this integrated financial communications and marketing business right out of college, and we employ about 400 people in eight offices worldwide. 
come check us out. And thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Money Maze podcast. For more information or to subscribe, please visit themoneymazepodcast.com. Hope to see you next time. All content on the Money Maze podcast is for your general information and use only and is not intended to address your particular requirements. In particular, the content does not constitute any form of advice, recommendation, representation, endorsement or arrangement and is not intended to be relied upon by users in making any specific investment or other decisions. Guests and presenters may have positions in any of the investments discussed.